Good evening. Welcome to our Bible study over Revelation. We are going to be starting right here in Revelation chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. For those of you that were here last week, we had a great discussion on one topic, and that was the book of life. I could easily go into multiple weeks on that topic, but for the sake of uh, completing the book of Revelation within the year 2024, I can't spend too much time on one topic. If you want to review what I had said last week, feel free to go back and watch that. If you have any questions, maybe something I did not cover because I, I only spent one night on it, I'd be happy to speak with you before or after any of our Bible studies or Sunday. Feel free to text me or call me. And just because I didn't talk about it doesn't mean there isn't more to that conversation. Hopefully, though, it was enough information to, if nothing else, pique your curiosity, and then you can do some research on your own. And then, as I said, if you feel like there's more conversation necessary, feel free to have that with me. Now, if before the Book of Life, though, we were looking at Revelation chapter uh, 12 and 13, and I told you that Revelation is full of metaphors. The trick in Revelation is recognizing which metaphors are a picture of a truth and which truths in Revelation are actually happening, but seem like they might be metaphors. For example, the demon army. There is not one, but two. And a lot of people look at those armies as metaphors. And they say, oh, that army is not demonic or spiritual. It's helicopters and it's military. And we discussed that at the time, that it just doesn't seem feasible. That even as a metaphor, that it would have been a good one if it's referring to an actual literal, literal army. A lot of people want to take the book of Revelation and make everything in Revelation a parable. That essentially, there is no direct explanation of truths in Revelation. It's all parables, and true wisdom is figuring out what the parables are saying. Then there are some that want to take everything literal, and I believe that although we should look at scriptural literal, it is a literal interpretation. When it's a parable, you literally take it as a parable. When it's a metaphor, you literally accept it as a metaphor. That is a literal interpretation. So knowing when Revelation is telling a story, when Revelation is giving a picture, and when Revelation is explaining actual events. Well, in Revelation chapter 13, we find another picture. We'd already seen one picture in the beginning of Revelation 13 of the, land, uh, of the sea beast. The sea beast, of course, representing the Antichrist. And those verses that we saw in the beginning of Revelation 13 gave enough description talking about uh, who this person was that we came to the conclusion, and there should be no doubt, that this is not an actual beast. This is not some mythical creature that's going to wander uh, the world during this time. And he's not a demonic being, although the Antichrist is possessed and will be possessed by Satan, if not possessed by his demons beforehand. Here we find another beast, and this one is the land beast. So we're going to start in Revelation chapter 13, verse 11. And I beheld another beast, this is the second in Revelation, coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. So this picture is describing for us the right-hand man of the Antichrist. He's called the prophet. I like to refer to him as the false prophet, as I think most theologians do. They don't want to give him the title, the honorific of prophet, so false prophet is attached. And it's interesting, some of these things, it's hard to know what God is trying to tell us when he describes the false prophet in this way. I think some we could come to a conclusion on, but it's only an assumption because what these things mean to us in 2024 may or may not have meant the same thing to the Jews back in the first century. You know, a big problem with interpreting Scripture, any book, Old or New Testament, is doing so through the eyes of the 21st century United States of America Christian. I'm not even talking about American Christian because you've got South American, Central American, North American, and how people in South America would interpret Scripture if done through the 21st century would be a lot different than how we would because of our culture, our background, and our experience. I am not saying that you need to be a historian to understand scripture. Please don't misinterpret or misunderstand what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you need to do an extensive research on uh, the Roman, the nation of Rome, and, and the, the nation of, of, of Israel throughout its entire history to truly understand scripture. God, in his wisdom, I believe, gave us all of the knowledge of culture that we need and, and require to have to interpret scripture correctly within his own word. You know, a lot of people don't like reading the Old Testament. There's a really a lot of great reasons to read the Old Testament. One is 
that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, which means the God of the Old Testament is the same God of the New Testament. A lot of people struggle with that. They say, how can that be? You look in the New Testament, he's a God of mercy and of grace, and you look in the Old Testament, he's a God of judgment and of wrath. I'm not sure what testaments you're reading because I would not say Revelation is without judgment and wrath, nor would I say in the Gospels is God without judgment and wrath. Literally, Jesus is dying on the cross because of God's judgment and wrath. The Gospels culminate in an act that is required because of God's judgment and wrath. Read the book of Acts. What do you find? You find Christians dropping dead because they lied about what they did with their own tithing money. You find other people dying martyrs for Christ. I know that's not God's judgment there, but it is, it is the, the fact that we live in a sinful, cursed world that Christians are dying for no other reason than spreading the gospel. You find throughout the Gospels, Christians being told God chastises those he loves. You find Christians being told that many of them among you are sick and even asleep or dead because of how you partake of the Lord's Supper. Uh, look, there is most definitely mercy and grace in the New Testament, but it's not only all that. God never is going to detach his judgment from his character because to do so would make God lose his justice. Who he is is a just God. So to say that God is only loving and God is only merciful is, a, is, is, a, is to not only misrepresent God, I would say it would be to blaspheme God. And by the way, when you end up down that road, you, you end up in a church where there is no sin and, you know, do whatever you'd like and God will wink at that sin and, and and please don't mis not misunderstand this. God does love all people. That is never without doubt or question. But to say God only loves and God does not judge sin, you end up with Christians who do not reflect God in his entirety. That can at best confuse the world, at worst turn the world away, because the world looks at the Bible and says, wait a second, it seems to me that you don't even understand your own God. Why would I listen to what you have to say when you claim to follow this God, and I look in just a few verses, and what you're saying doesn't match what I see in the Bible? So either the Bible's not true, or you're not telling me the truth. That's at worst. Uh, someone who's unsafe, who doesn't read the Bible, might be attracted to your version of God that has no judgment or justice, but they're just confused now. I said at best, they're confused. So let's look at the Old Testament. Is God only judgment? Is God only justice in the Old Testament? Of course not. How many hundreds of years did God patiently give the nation of Israel before he finally brought them into exile under the Assyrians first, and then hundreds of more years before the Babylonians brought them into exile? Hundreds of years of patience. How many decades did, of patience did God give the nation of Israel between each judge? I mean, we're talking some 50-plus years where they're living in sin, and God says, I'm going to give you time, I'm going to give you time. Finally, they, they fall under the, you might say, servitude of, a, of another nation. Then God, in his mercy, brings them out and gives them another chance. How many judges did he go through? How many decades between each one? There is mercy in the Old Testament. So reading the Old Testament gives you a bigger picture of God because more information is always better than less information especially when attached to God. So why would you literally ignore, and I'm not even going to say half the Bible, because the Old Testament makes up two-thirds of the Bible. Why would you ignore two, you know, up to two-thirds of the Bible when you can know two-thirds more about God? Well, I don't like what I see about God in the Old Testament. Well, <laughs> too bad, yes. Hey, look, if you don't like what you see in the Old Testament, it might be you don't understand what you see in the Old Testament. Why? Because, again, you're interpreting the Old Testament through the 21st century culture in which you live. And the 21st century culture in which you live, we don't go and raid other villages or get raided by other villages because we live in the United States, and Texas isn't raiding Connecticut. But I'll tell you what, if you can just open your eyes to the culture of that time and understand what the Jews must have been experiencing when they couldn't send their children three miles away out of fear that the next-door neighbor Philistines might kidnap or worse to your child, then you might understand why God seems to be cruel, but what it actually is, protection over the people he loves in such a harsh way. You might actually appreciate that when that harsh protection results in the safety of your own infant child, your eight-year-old daughter, where if God did not harshly protect, that eight-year-old girl would never make it 18. And if she did, the trauma she'd suffer along the way. You see how things change? It's called perspective. That's the problem. A lot of us don't want to step out of our perspective. We want to interpret the Bible through our own perspective, and then we don't like what we see because it doesn't make sense. 
If you read the whole Bible, not only do you get a better view of God, you get a better view of the culture at that time, and then you get a better understanding of what God is saying when he uses metaphors and parables and illustrations, and you're outside of the danger of interpreting them through our own culture. Now, having said all of that, there are still some things, like Revelation chapter 13, where you're still going to struggle on what exactly is God trying to say when he describes the false prophet in this manner. And so my challenge to you there is don't read deeper into Scripture what God has already given. You might end up creating a whole new cult and you don't even know it. You've created a, a belief system that is not only outside of God's Word, but is contrary to it because you, in your thirst for knowledge, wants more than God is willing to give you. Sometimes, can you believe it? There might be truths that God did not necessarily intend for the 21st century Christian to know. He intended for the first century Christian to know. Now, that might hurt your pride, but you need to accept that fact, that God doesn't intend for us 21st century Christians to be perfect in our knowledge. He does want us to walk by faith. And faith literally requires you to not know everything, because if you know everything, faith is not necessary. So God has a reason for why he might not reveal every part of a parable, every deep understanding of a metaphor, because God wants us to have faith with the knowledge we do have. That does not mean don't keep looking for it. I'm just warning you, don't create what isn't there. That is the warning. Definitely seek out more knowledge. Just make sure you're seeking it from the source of truth and wisdom, God's word, and then you'll be on safe ground. Okay, let's get back to chapter 13, verse 11. So we see two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Now, don't be confused about that two horns like a lamb. You say, oh, isn't that representing the lamb, Jesus Christ? Uh, not necessarily. That word lamb could be interchangeable with ram, and I think that when you talk about two horns, we're talking more about a ram than we are a lamb. And he spake as a dragon. Now, that one, I can most definitely tell you what it means. Satan is defined as a dragon, literally in Revelation. The same word, the same description, dragon. And so... He has the horns of a ram. The, the, this picture I put up here makes it almost like, like a buffalo. I'm not saying that that can't be the case. That may, you know, I'm guessing ram. It could be a bull or something else. I, just, I don't think it's sheep. I don't think we're talking sheep here. I, I, I haven't seen a sheep with you know, the pointed horns. So I think we're talking about something that is outside of the realm of the, of the perfect sacrifice that Christ is. This is the false prophet, right? Wouldn't make sense that, that he would be that unless it's, it's, it's pseudo. You know, it's, it's fake. But I think what we're trying to say here is he is, is not Christ. He is something different. What that means, I couldn't tell you. That, that two horns of a, of a ram or a, a goat or a lamb, whatever it is, I don't really necessarily know that I could tell you what that means. But I do know that when he speaks as a dragon, it basically means he's speaking for the dragon. This man is not speaking the truth of Christ. This false prophet is speaking the truth of Satan. Verse 12, he exerciseth all the power of the first beast. Who is the Antichrist? What does that mean? It means that uh, he's the one who is essentially doing the heavy lifting. <laughs> the Antichrist is, is the pretty face. Not that the Antichrist doesn't have power. We saw the power of the Antichrist when, it's, when he's described. He has power. But it doesn't seem that he's the one flexing his muscle. It is the false prophet as it, that is the strong arm of this duo. It is the false prophet that, it, that is the behind-the-scenes guy. He is the one who is spreading the misinformation, the mouth of the dragon. He is the one that is bullying people into submission, the horns of the lamb or the ram, if, if that is what it means. The Antichrist is the pretty smile, the pretty face that everyone wants to love, and the false prophet is the one standing behind with the club, right? Because it's hard to be both. <laughs> it's hard to be the enforcer and the pretty face. And so they, Satan knows how the human condition works, so Satan gives the people the smile of the Antichrist, and the, the muscle of the false prophet. It's not all muscle, by the way. It's better and easier to win someone over with, with amazement than it is with fear. And so the false prophet definitely has power, and he exercises it. He, he has the miracles of demonic power behind him. And so those he can't woo with the demonic miracles, he beats into submission. And those that will not submit to his beating, he just kills. He just gets them off the table. Will, why mess with them any further? He doesn't need to win over the, the rebellious, he might, as far as he would be concerned. Okay, verse 12. Causeth the earth, and then which dwell therein to worship who? The first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. All right, let's, let's talk about this. Isn't it amazing that Satan's followers 
are more willing to point to someone else if it meets their end goal than themselves. Here you have the false prophet. He's got the power. He's got the ability. He's got the muscle. And yet he's living his life and his, his ministry to point to someone else. This is a man of Satan that's willing to do that. How many men and women of God are saying, look at me? <laughs> Puts us to shame, right? When Satan's followers are saying, don't look at me. It's not about me. It's about this person over here. And God's followers are saying, ooh, ooh, you know, look at me, hands wave, jumping up and down. Look how great I look. Look how sharp my hair is and how pretty smile, my smile and my, my shoes and everything that I'm wearing. Look how important I am. The followers of God, isn't this crazy? Could learn something from the follower of Satan. <laughs> that everything he does is to point to the Antichrist. Oh, if only we, as the followers of God, could do that as good as this false prophet. And it works. It works very well. Between the two of these, the pretty face and the muscle, the world is drawn to these men. The world. This is not some small, off-the-path, beaten village. This, this is high-powered people. The elite, the wealthy, the smart, the beautiful, the talented. All of them are drawn to this formula. You know why? It works. That is why God gave the Christians the same formula, because it works. Are some people drawn to those that say, I'm the best, look at me? Yes, those kinds of people are drawn to that kind of person. The rest of the world looks at that person with disgust, saying you're literally living your life, you know, with, with a big old sign, arrow saying, you know, blinking, look at me, look at me, look at me. Even the unsaved can get disgusted by that. So God has given us a formula that works. God says, look, you, you sing your own praises, sure, you'll get some followers. You'll get the foolish. You'll get the naive. You'll get the prideful. You'll get the one that hope that they can bask in your glory and, and, and gain some of that legacy for themselves. But God says what really works, what really draws a lot of people is when you invest your life and point to something else and say, this is worth, worth living for. This person is worth living for. That formula works, which is why God gave it to the church. And God told the church, Point to him. It is God's legacy, Christ's legacy, not our own. The Antichrist knows this. The false prophet knows this. And the false prophet is willing to live a life and a ministry that points to someone other than himself. And then we're told in verse 12 that they worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. I had stated that I believe the Antichrist Halfway through the tribulation, three and a half years in, we're told that the, the two prophets, the two witnesses, die. And I believe it's the Antichrist who kills them. I believe that in that battle with these two guys, though, the Antichrist is wounded. This verse doesn't tell us that it's connected to the event with the two witnesses, but it does seem to me that it fits well with that event. It is during this time that the Antichrist, halfway through the Revelation, goes into the temple that has been rebuilt, the temple that is supposed to be used by the Jews to honor God. He walks in and says, I am God, Stop, start worshiping me. Well, this is in Jerusalem, and this is where the two witnesses preach. I have no doubt the two witnesses were not thrilled with that event. In fact, I believe personally that the two witnesses preaching against this event didn't just say words. They started doing what they do because we know the two witnesses also had power given them by God. So a fight ensues. The two witnesses die, and it seems that the, the Antichrist, we're told in verse 12, has a deadly wound. Now, another passage of Scripture implies he might have actually died. We don't know for certain. The, the Bible isn't clear enough for us to know, did he actually die? Did he almost die? Was it a near-death experience? But the world thought he died. So whatever did happen, it was so severe, people thought he died. Maybe he, you know, he, he, he died, you might say, for three minutes or whatever and had CPR, but I don't think that's the case because it seems to be a miraculous event in verse 12, not just someone giving this guy CPR. And who's the one that performed this miraculous event either to bring the Antichrist back from the dead or seemingly brought him back from the dead? It was the false prophet. The false prophet, the Antichrist, and Satan are the, the evil trinity, the, the fake pseudo-trinity of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And it's interesting to see that, that the roles each play are similar to the roles of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. God the Father seems to be the one who, who 
gives direction. Jesus Christ, on more than one occasion, talks about the will of the Father and doing the will of the Father. Not that one person, the Trinity, has authority over any other, or not that one is more powerful than any other, but there are different roles they play. And Jesus talks about the will of the Father. Well, the Antichrist is obviously doing the will of Satan, his father. The Holy Spirit is God and deserves to be worshipped. And if, if, if a Christian ever believes the Holy Spirit doesn't deserve to be worshipped, it's because they have a misunderstanding of the Holy Spirit. He's God. He does, deserves as much worship as, as God the Son, God the Father does. But it's interesting that God the Holy Spirit often points to God the Son. Often. Doesn't really make his ministry about himself. He deserves to. He's worthy of it. But his ministry is to speak of Christ and the things of Christ. And we see the false prophet doing the same for the Antichrist, who, obviously, is the Antichrist, the fake Christ. Just as Christ died and rose again, the Antichrist is now trying to play that same game, either claiming to have died or did die, if this actually is the case, in a way to mimic Christ. All right, so the false prophet who... I would say is a pseudo-Holy Spirit, seems to heal him from his deadly wound. Verse 13, does great wonders, makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. Then verse 16, we're told he brings in the mark of the beast. This is halfway through. And the mark, of quote, we're told is the number of his name, verse 17. And that, of course, is 666 in verse 18. All right, let's break down some of the things we just read. He arises from the earth, portrays himself as innocent and godly. Of course, he's following the will of Satan, encourages the worship of the Antichrist. He is not here to be worshipped. He is here to strong arm you to worship because we literally just read, if you don't worship the image of the Antichrist, you're killed. He can perform miracles, calling fire down from heaven, which is interesting. The two witnesses also had the power over fire. We're told they could speak it, whereas the false prophet can call it down like the prophet Elijah could of old. It's similar to the story of Moses and Aaron as they come into Pharaoh's palace and God gives them the miraculous abilities and then the, the servants of Pharaoh perform some of the similar miraculous abilities. But there comes to a point where Moses and Aaron can do things the servants of Pharaoh can no longer do. But to some point, Satan's power does look like it can match God's, but God's proves in the end it's not even close. Oh, here we go. Doesn't tolerate dissension, right? If you do not worship the image that he not only has built, but he gives life to. Now, this is interesting. Of course, we know today with animatronics and technology, you know, companies today throughout the world are creating life, life-size and life-like things that we know aren't real. I don't believe this is what's going on. I believe at this point in the tribulation, if we're halfway through, not all technology has been eliminated. I think that has to be the case because the whole world watches as the two witnesses die and raise again. So there has to be some form of technology. And if that's the case, people aren't going to be so easily swayed by an animatronic. Okay? This is not Disney World. I don't think it's going to be that's, that's what's happening. I can't tell you in what way the false prophet brings life to this image that people are convinced it's more than technology. I don't know. But whatever it is, it's demonic. And maybe it's because if you don't worship this living, now what seems to be living statue, you die. The Bible doesn't tell us how they die. Could it be the statue itself kills them? I think that might be a convincing argument, right? Animatronics, fortunately, don't kill you when you walk by in disbelief. This one will. Now, in what way it kills them, and if it even does kill them, I can't tell you for certain. But that would be a convincing argument on why it's more than just technology. Oh, here, let's go back. I'm sorry. And then the mark of the beast. Okay, let's talk about this mark of the beast. This is something that even the world is intrigued by. Hollywood has taken this idea of the mark of the beast, brought it into movies. Hollywood, who does not believe in any way the truth of the Bible or that there is a God, is intrigued by this idea that that a marking 666 associates you with Satan. 
So this is something that, of course, been, has been around as long as the book of Revelation. Did you know that the mark of the beast, 666, is not in the Old Testament? You're not going to find it there. Um, let's go ahead and take a look, though, at 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. You can keep your place in Revelation 13. So there's two things I want to talk about regarding the mark of the beast. Both of them are pretty debated discussions within Christianity. And the first one is going to be this idea of when can someone get saved? In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8, we read, And then shall the wicked that be revealed, who the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and all, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. Verse 11, and for this cause shall God send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but have pleasure in unrighteousness. There's a lot of people who believe that verse is referring to any, Christ, any, any person who heard the truth of the gospel before the rapture, and whether you believe the rapture is before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, doesn't matter where you believe the rapture is, there is a strong belief system that if you heard the truth before the rapture and did not get saved, after the rapture, you cannot get saved. This idea right here that God is going to give you a strong delusion and essentially keep you from accepting the truth. Now, we do know that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, if you look at the context of verses around it, we do know that 2 Thessalonians 2 is taking place at the end times. It does not say at what point in the end times, but at some point in the end times, some people will no longer allow to be, be allowed to be saved, which is a unique event only to this time, and you don't see anywhere else ever in Scripture that happening. You say, well, Pastor Russ, you were just talking about Pharaoh. Didn't God also harden Pharaoh's heart? Isn't that similar to what's happening here? No, the hardening of Pharaoh's heart had nothing to do with the man's salvation. It had to do with the man's judgment when it came to letting the people of Israel go. God did not harden Pharaoh's heart so that he went to hell. God hardened Pharaoh's heart so he'd make a bad judgment call so God could use Pharaoh and the nation of Egypt as a testimony of how powerful God is versus, at that time, the most powerful nation in the world. There was nothing that kept Pharaoh from being saved according to the story of Exodus, if you read it. Now, having said that, also, God hardened Pharaoh's heart, but you'll find that before God does so, Pharaoh hardened his own heart. The Bible throughout the book of Exodus says, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. More than one time, it tells us, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. Then we read at some point, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So essentially, God just encouraged Pharaoh and allowed Pharaoh to solidify the direction he already chose for himself. Now, there is some similarity between that and this, but the one hardening of a heart is a judgment call, not a salvation thing. This in 2 Thessalonians is without a doubt a salvation thing. And there's nowhere else in Scripture where God does this to anyone ever. Where he says, I'm going to make a decision to keep you from being saved. So some believe that this decision is applied to anyone who heard the truth before the rapture. After the rapture, God says, you had the chance you blew it. You can't get saved at any point during the tribulation. Well, if that's the case, then where did all the witnesses come from? 144,000 plus witnesses. Where did all the martyrs come from? We're going to read later in Revelation where heaven is opened and a bunch of people are singing, and it specifically talks about them dying during the tribulation. Well, then how are they in heaven if they've been martyred? Well, they never heard the truth before. So all these people were people who didn't hear the gospel, got saved during the tribulation, and then they died. Okay, possible. But 144,000 are Jews, and you're telling me these Jews never heard about Christ, never heard about the Messiah? That's hard to believe. Not saying it's impossibility, very improbable. Either way, I will point out again, verse 11 doesn't tell us when that strong delusion takes place. It just tells us it will take place at some point in the end times. And now, I would like you to turn back to Revelation. Let's skip chapter 13 and go to chapter 14. And verse 9. 
Wouldn't it be amazing if God sent angels to preach to us instead of men, fallible men and women? Wouldn't it be great if every Sunday morning we showed up and an angel led us in worship and then began to speak the words of God? I would love that. That'd be so awesome. I wonder, would people respond better? You would think, right? Wouldn't that be a good assumption that people would respond, respond better to an angel that was there and then gone? I would think so. Yet during the tribulation period, there are going to be so many crazy events that cannot be explained by science, and yet people are still going to say, we hate God, including angels preaching. So in Revelation 14, you find not one, not two, but three angels preaching, one after the other. They circumnavigate the globe, preaching from the air to ensure that everyone, all of humanity, can hear the message. They don't just arrive at one church, and hopefully you're at that church at that time to hear the message. They go to the masses, which is what Christ did. They preach they have a different message, each of them. For sake of time tonight, we're just going to look at the message in verse 9. The third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever." We're obviously talking about hell here. <laughs> this third angel, the third of the, 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 the majestic preachers, states to the entire world, if you take the mark of the beast, you're not getting saved. It's not going to happen. It's a done deal. You'll live out whatever life you have left, but in the end, eternity in hell is the only place you'll go. The second time that God pretty much says, you do this, it's over. Both times during the end times, neither one alluding to the other text, but both of them saying the same thing. I have absolutely no doubt in my mind that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and Revelation 14 are talking about the same time and the same event for the same reason to the same people. I do not for a moment believe that someone who hears the gospel cannot get saved after the rapture. I do believe with all my heart and all my knowledge that once you take in the mark of the beast, it's over. That God will send a strong delusion. No matter what you see or hear, you will not believe or have faith in God as your Savior. We are going to have, at the end of tonight, a chance for a discussion, and I'm happy to hear you out if you have some thoughts on that. But hold on then to them for now, and let's go ahead and continue. God has his own followers during this time. God has his own chosen. And in Revelation chapter 14, we read in verse 1, And I looked, and then lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, and with him a hundred, forty, and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. What does that mean, that name? You look at the picture, it's not a name, is it? What did I put it? What did I choose up here? I didn't draw this. I chose the picture as a number, seven. Well, Pastor Russ, it says name. There's a name there. Is Yahweh written? Is Elohim written? I... I don't know that I got it right when I put a number up there, but I will tell you this. Look back again at verse 17 of chapter 13. What was written on the forehead of Satan's followers? The number of his name. In Revelation chapter 13, a number is the name of Satan. So is it possible that there's not an actual name with, with letters, Hebrew or otherwise, on the followers, the 144,000. Is it possible? They also have a number of God's name. Now, when it talks about the name on the foreheads of the followers of Christ, it does not say the number of God's name. It just says name. Whereas with the 666, it is referred to as the number of his name. It comes down to, I don't really care what it is. I won't be one of the 144,000. It does not affect me. But I, I chose this picture to show you the possibility that it's not an actual name. We'll all find out at the same time in heaven. But it could be a number. And if it is a number, I personally thought, oh, well, seven might be it. And it could be three, right? There's other numbers that seem to have significance to God. Let's not turn uh, Mimic BC into a whole other religion over this topic. It is just something that I think is intriguing, and we'll kind of leave it at that. It is nothing that I would create a belief system out of. But it is a thought that... that tickles the mind, causes you to consider a little deeper than you might have in other ways. All right, let's keep going. Verse 2. I heard the voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with harps. 
oh, you ever wonder why Hollywood thinks every Christian has a harp in heaven? Well, that's one reason right there. There seems to be harps in heaven. Doesn't, seem, doesn't mean we all get one. Doesn't mean we're all using one. I certainly hope not. Uh, but there are going to be some with harps in heaven. And they sung it as it were a new song before the throne, before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 144,000, which are redeemed from the earth. All right, these guys are dead. They're in heaven, singing the praises of God. They've been redeemed from the earth. Isn't that a great way to view death for the believer? We think of it as loss. God thinks it as gain. God literally says, you died, but I redeemed you. I, I, I gained you. I received you from the earth. If only we as Christians could have a, just a small glimpse through the eyes of God of what death is, we would not be so overly distraught when a believer passes from this life to the next. I am not saying don't sorrow. I am not saying do not have feelings of remorse and, and, and even a little bit of anger, because I get loss can cause anger. I'm not saying be emotionless when you lose a loved one. I'm just saying at some point sooner than later, recognize it's a redemption process. God has redeemed them from the earth. God has brought them from the tragedy, the chaos, the trauma of this life into glory. These 144,000, above and beyond all other believers, are given a unique gift, the gift of a song. If you read again, you'll find that this song in verse 3 is only known by these 144,000. No other person in the world, past, present, or future, can learn this song, ever will learn this song for eternity. A song that you will hear and be beautiful, but you just can't put the words together. And when you try to sing it yourself, it just doesn't happen. It's like uh, the little child trying to uh, sing the national anthem, and they're using words like bees and ships and other things that are not in the anthem. And they're, they're, they're stringing together a bunch of silly words to the tune of the national anthem because they know what it sounds like, but they can't speak the words. I'm not even sure we'll be that close. It'll be a song that will give you chills when you hear and lift your heart Intrigue your mind, but you just will never for eternity, as many times as you hear it, ever be able to learn it. Why? This is God's gift to the 144,000. I said there was two things I wanted to talk about tonight. The first was, can someone get saved after the rapture? That is a pretty big deal for a lot of people, especially a lot of preachers. And hopefully I've cleared up that. The second one is, who are the 144,000? Because there's an entire religion based off of the fact that you can be one of the 104,000. Now, good luck with that. If you look at, I'm not here to bash that religion. I don't need to. I feel like their own version of the truth is sufficient to bash themselves. I don't need to do it myself. But this religion that, is, that, that teaches this and what you have to do to become one of it, even they, even the best of them aren't certain that they are the 144. You are literally competing with every person in that religion from all time. I just like, what are the odds? How good do you have to be? And who tells you you've made it? So their entire belief system is based off of this idea of who are the 144,000. There's a lot of Christians who believe that God has given up on the Jews. And Jews made a mistake they can't come back from. And that God has transferred all of his covenants and all of his promises from the Jews to the church. And now they believe another reason to read the Old Testament is because every promise to Abraham is yours personally. And every promise to the nation of Israel is, is the churches personally. They, they really strongly believe this. And so when they see the 144,000, they think it's the church. Now, again, I'm not going to say all believe to the same level that you can become literally one. I think a lot of them think it's more metaphorical. And if, if you believe that, that, there, that God has given up on the Jews, they would just say that the 144,000 may represent the church as a whole. While some might believe you could actually be one of the 144,000. You're down that same road again, then of good luck. I don't believe God has given up, given up on the Jews. The Jews have not done anything God was not aware they would do, and God did not make a promise that he intended to break. God made the promise in the Old Testament to Abraham on his own character. I'd be greatly disturbed by a God making a promise on his own character who's willing to break it because of the deficiencies of the one he made the promise to, especially if this God knew the deficiencies of the one he made the promise to. Fortunately for me and you, that's not the kind of God we serve. So I do not believe in what's called covenant theology, which is this idea that all the promises to the Jews are now the churches. I don't believe that. I believe we can look at the covenants God made with Israel and learn something about our God. 
I believe some of the covenants God made with Israel, you might say, splash onto the church with those who bless Abraham are blessed, that kind of thing, right? I believe there's some indirect blessing through the covenants God had with Israel when we, as a church, treat Israel the way that God intends. But I do not believe that everything God promised Abraham and his descendants are ours. I believe God has given us our own covenant, our own promises, like the promise of the rapture, which was not given to the nation of Israel. It was given to the church. So we have our own promises and our own covenants and our own relationship with God. We don't need to steal theirs. So when I see the 144,000, I take it as it is given. And how is it given? Well, I believe it's given that this 144,000 is the, the various tribes of Israel. Now, I had a handout given, distributed here. You can pull that out now. It's not up on the screen, so I apologize for those watching online. You're going to have to uh, go ahead and just listen to me for the remaining five to ten minutes. I'm going to back up and there we go. We're going to go this way. There you go. That's the end of the image. I'm not going to show you any more images. Now we can just focus on what we're going to talk about, and that is the tribes of Israel. Now, we are told in another passage of Scripture in Revelation where the 144,000 are mentioned, and, and they are given uh, each tribe. And, and, I'm gonna, and you see here, let's, let's just go through them. In Genesis chapter 29, verse 32, we are given the first tribe, the oldest son, Reuben. His name means, surely the Lord hath looked upon my affliction. He was the son of Leah, the oldest of the two sisters that married uh, Israel or Jacob. In the next verse, we find Leah has another son, Simeon. And she states, his name means, because God hath heard, the Lord hath heard, he hath therefore given me this son. Leah has a third son, Levi. And she states, now this time will my husband be joined unto me. Now, uh, Israel is referred to as the bride of Christ, but I believe literally that Leah is, is stating, Jacob will now love me more than he loves my sister Rachel because I've given him three sons and she's given him none. It was a competition between these two sisters, unfortunately. What a mess. Uh, in verse 35 of Genesis 29, Leah has a fourth son, and she says, now will I praise the Lord. Well, that's, that's unfortunate. <laughs> you only praise the Lord when God gives you what you want. Kind of shows you the heart of Leah. Not, I wouldn't say a godly woman. I'm not going to say that she's a reprobate, but that's unfortunate that Leah says, God's given me, now I'll praise the Lord. That's not how it ought to be. Now, you see Dan is omitted in Revelation. That's going to be the next son, Dan. And, and Revelation 7 is where this list, we're going to turn there when we're done. We're going to read through these, and we'll go to Revelation 7. All right, so then uh, we are mentioned Dan. Now, this is, this is not Leah's son. Leah stops having children, and in a desire to win the favor of Jacob, she now gives her servant, Bilhal, to Jacob, and she starts, Bilhal starts having children for Jacob. Um, so Bilhal has her first son, Dan, and Leah names him. Isn't that crazy? Bill Hall goes through the effort and the process, and then essentially her child becomes Leah's child. That's just, wow. Okay, uh, Dan is his name. God hath judged me and heard my voice, is what Leah says. Bill Hall has a, a second child, Nephtali. Uh, with great wrestlings, I have prevailed. Wrestling against who? Uh, Rachel, <laughs> Jacob, God, right? I fought my way to this point. I have now given uh, my husband... Uh, six children, four to, through me and two through my servant. I've wrestled my way, hopefully, to victory, to the favor of my husband. And then we're, we're told in uh, verse 30, oh, I'm sorry, I said Leah. These are Rachel's, these are Rachel's servants, my bad. Rachel is, is jealous of Leah having all these children. So Rachel gives her servant Bill Hall, and now Rachel has two. And then in uh, chapter 30, verse 11, Leah Gives her servant, follows suit. Leah stops having children. So now she gives Zilpah. This is Leah's servant, Zilpah. Uh, Gad means a troop, a troop cometh, or good fortune. And then verse 13 of chapter 30, Leah's servant, Zilpah. A second one, Asher. Happy am I. Call me blessed. And then uh, Leah has another child, her fifth child, Issachar. God hath given me my hire. You know what I deserve, right? I deserve this from God because of all I've gone through. God owed me. And uh, then Leah has another child, Zebulon. Now will my husband dwell with me? And then Rachel finally has her own children outside of her silver servant, Bill Hall. Joseph, the Lord shall add, and Benjamin, the son of the right hand. Okay, there's two more mentioned down there, Manasseh and Ephraim. These are the children of Joseph. The reason I'm mentioning them is because they do get integrated into the tribe of Israel as two of the 12 tribes. Did you know that when you read through the various books of the Old Testament, there is not 12 tribes? There's 13 tribes. You say, well, Pastor Russ, I'm reading 14 here, so you're wrong, there's 14. Well, 
when Jacob was blessing his children, he blesses the 11 of them, then he comes to Joseph, and Joseph gets a double portion of blessing. His two children, Ephraim and Manasseh, actually Manasseh was the eldest, so Manasseh and Ephraim, are blessed on equal plane or level to the 11 children of Jacob or Israel. There are 13 blessings given to 13 children. 11 of them are Jacob's, and two of them are Jacob's grandson. And Joseph isn't blessed in the sense of his brothers. His blessing is that his children are blessed in his place. You can go there if you'd like. In Numbers 132, we actually find that Joseph's name, it seems, to be interchangeable with the tribe of Ephraim. And on your own time, you can look there and you'll see, and the tribe of Joseph or Ephraim, essentially. So it seems that Ephraim and the tribe of Joseph are one and the same. Because there are multiple occasions in the Old Testament where actually it's mentioned the tribe of Joseph. And neither Ephraim or Manasseh are mentioned. And then in Numbers 132, Ephraim and Joseph are both mentioned. And so, depending on the context and what's going on, the Jews would have understood that the tribe of Joseph was two tribes. And if Manasseh is mentioned and Joseph is mentioned, okay, well, that's Manasseh and Ephraim. So, let's now go to Revelation chapter 7. There are 13 tribes of Israel. Well, Pastor Russ, why were there only 12 portions of land given if there are 13 tribes? Because Levi didn't get a portion of land. Why not? Because Levi was the preaching tribe. They were the priestly tribe. God did not want Levi, isn't this interesting, to own large portions of land. Levi owned cities where the priests could dwell. Levi owned some properties within the nations, but not a nation themselves. It seems that God didn't want the tribe of Levi getting rich off of their preaching. God didn't want the tribe of Levi to be known as those who will preach for profit, or you might say priest for profit, right? Now, God did not design the church the same way as the tribes of Israel. There's nothing wrong with the pastor getting paid, owning a house, owning property, but it does kind of give you a glimpse into the heart of God. I don't think God ever intended for preachers to get rich. I don't think God ever intended for the preachers to have houses four times the size as the parishioners. I am not against a pastor and his family living comfortably. In fact, in the Old Testament, the priests lived comfortably. God made sure of that. They had homes. They had nice homes. They had food. They ate pretty well. They were eating steak regularly, okay? So it wasn't like they're living off of, of lentils and, and locusts, okay? So the priests were well taken care of. They had homes. They had a job. They had nice clothing. It seems fairly nice clothing from what they were wearing. Pretty good stuff. So it's not that God wants priests to live in a ditch, but he doesn't want, to, want them to amass uh, large amounts of wealth. That's what I think is the heart of God. Now, where's that line crossed, right? What's large amounts of wealth? Because what's large amounts of wealth to this person versus that person will not be the same definition. God never tells us what that number is, but I think the heart of God is at some point you step, you cross over a line. might be just best not to get close to that line if you are representing the preaching of the Word of God. That's some thoughts there. All right. Revelation chapter 7. We are given the tribes. Verse 4. There were sealed 144,000. Here we go. Verse 5. Judah, Reuben, uh, Gad, Asher, Nephilim, uh, Manassas, or Manasseh, Simeon, Levi. Wow, why is Levi sealed here if Levi wasn't given one of the portions of land? Because these sealed tribes aren't for land. They are for what? Preaching. Wouldn't it make sense if you're going to choose a tribe to preach, you choose the tribe of Levi? Right, totally makes sense. So don't say, well, why is Levi here when Levi is not one of the 12 land tribes? Because God's not giving land here. God is calling tribes to preach for him. So, of course, Levi is going to be one of those. What is odd is not that Levi is chosen. You can read the, the rest there. Just take my word for it if, if, if you don't want to read it. All of the tribes are mentioned except for one. In fact, you could say two. Because we find, let's keep going. Uh, let me skip down here. Okay, verse 8, of the tribe of who? Joseph. All right, so two are not mentioned, Ephraim and Dan. But I've already told you, Numbers 132 gives a strong implication that Ephraim and Joseph are interchangeable. As well as in other passages, Joseph is interchangeable with both Manasseh and Ephraim. So I wouldn't be overly concerned about that. I think 
Ephraim is included under the name of Joseph. What is intriguing is that Dan is not. There's no way around that. You, you can't replace any other name with Dan. If you do, you lose another tribe. And nowhere else in Scripture is Dan replaced with any other name, like Ephraim is replaced with Joseph. Dan's not here. Why? Theologians don't have an answer. I don't have an answer. God's Word does not tell us why. But I can tell you what is the common answer from at least most theologians that I read from and have studied under and agree with, and that is, in the book of Judges, you find the nation of Israel constantly turning their backs on God. The whole nations, all the tribes, in and out of a relationship with God. There was one nation that really seemed to take it a lot further than most, and that is the tribe of Dan. We don't have time, but there's a story of the tribe of Dan saying, we don't like the land God gave us. They send out some scouts to look for better land. They find a place where people live, peaceful people, not warlike people. They're not, they're not you know, necessarily killing their, their fellow Jewish brothers, but they find a place they like that belongs to another nation that God didn't necessarily give them. They steal it. They kill people. But you say, well, that's what the Jews did too. Yeah, out of God's command of who deserved to be eliminated and what land belonged to the Jews, the, Dan, the, Dan, the Danites said, we want what God hasn't given us, and we're going to kill who God has not judged. And then on their way, they find a priest. And this is a priest for hire, <laughs> this guy. He's already with a man uh, and a farm for no other reason that this guy's paying him a lot of money to, to be his own personal priest. But the Danites, on their way up, find this farm, raid the farm, find the guy, the Levite, and say, oh, you want to be, be our priest? We'll give you more than this farmer. And the Levite says, Done. <laughs> And you find not long after, Dan, of course, would, would follow, right, it has, has turned the, 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 the theology of Jehovah into a, a parcel about God and mostly about something else. It, it, they bring in the calf, the golden calf, and, and you find that essentially idolatry seeps back into Israel a lot through the efforts of Dan. And so a lot of theologians say, well, there's no mention of that. God doesn't say that, but it, it seems to make sense because there's really no other scripture that would imply that Dan should not be included here. Dan was the avenue of idolatry into Israel. They said, we don't want what God wants for us, and we're going to kill who God has not judged, and then we're going to change what God has said, and then we're going to teach it to everyone else. I think that's a pretty good reason why Dan might not be included. Don't take it as theology. Don't take it as fact. It is an assumption. I think a pretty good one, but an assumption nonetheless. What's the lesson there? If I am correct in my assumption, God does not take lightly the blasphemy of his name, the misrepresentation of his character and his truth, the rejection of what he wants for us, and the murder of those he has not judged. It's a pretty big deal to be part of the nation of Israel and the culmination of world events, you're not invited. That's a big deal. Is the tribe of Dan even still around? Hard to say. I'll end with this. Some theologians, I am not one of them, claim another reason for the tribe of Dan not being mentioned. They believe the Antichrist is a Jew of the tribe of Dan, and that is why they're not here. They essentially brought idolatry into the nation of Israel and brought the Antichrist <laughs> into the world. I, I feel like that's a little far-fetched. I feel like you're stretching really hard to make that connection, but it is an intriguing thought. Scripture does not give us a reason to not think that. I just don't see enough connections to go that far with my assumptions. But hey, an assumption is an assumption is an assumption, right? So if I can make mine, you can make yours. We do know this. Dan's not there. Sam, if you want to turn off the uh, audio and visual, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I will see you next Wednesday as we continue our study in the